Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Legendarium Podcast. I am your host, Craig Hanks. With me today, Mary Rickard. Mary, how are you? I'm good. Thank you, Craig. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. And you are here uh, for a, a very specific, well, <laughs> how should I put this? It's a specific purpose, but a broad subject. We're talking about short stories today. Uh, and if anybody listened a few weeks ago to the conversation I had with Freya Marsk, uh, she and I chatted about uh, romance, uh, you know, science fiction and fantasy romance and, and how, how and why and all of this stuff around romance. Uh, and it was a very illuminating and educating conversation um, for me, at least. <laughs> and that's what I'm hoping to do today. We're talking about short fiction because, Mary, you are... Uh, and uh, an excellent, you are a well-traveled um, and well-awarded <laughs> practitioner of the art of the short story. Uh, do you want to give us a little bit of your background and, and some of the work that people might want to check out? Oh, okay. My background um, in short story writing probably began with my years of trying to be a poet. And um <laughs> talk more about that later if you want, you know, about how that experience of trying to work with that structure, um, eventually I see its benefit in the short story writing. So, but what happened was at a certain point I took all my poetry out, well, not all, but, you know, whatever I had done in the past couple of years, and I, I looked at it, um, and I had a hard realization that I actually wasn't that good of a poet. <laughs> oh, no. You know? and, but what I saw when I, when I started reading everything was that most of my poetry had a little flavor of a story to it. Hmm. So after I um, mourned a little bit my idea of working in poetry, I thought, I think I should try writing short stories you know, which I probably had done in between poetry a little bit. But then I, I, you know, decided to work on short stories. And um, the first short story, I, so I was writing short stories, I was sending them out, I was writing, you know, getting rejected. I'm old enough that I was doing the things with uh, an envelope inside of an envelope. And because I was kind of broke at the time, well, I was broke. There was you know, <laughs> actually measure the two, and this is the envelope without the envelope in it. So I didn't have to pay that two cents more for mm. the, um, when it came back to me. And, um, you know, was, was continuing to be rejected quite thoroughly. And as, at some point I wrote this story and I don't know. I don't know why, <laughs> but I wrote a story and it was called The Girl Who Ate Butterflies. And it was about a young woman who had, um, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that happens, obviously. And she's going through a sort of a, a recognition of who she is and a transformation of her life. And there's this point at the end where she... Um, goes out to this field, if I'm remembering this right, and she lays down and she, you know, a butterfly you know, lands on her mouth or she pick, plucks it out. I can't remember. It's a long time ago. But she starts, she eats it. And I think maybe she was eating butterflies before then too. But anyway, when she eats this butterfly at the end of the story, I remember sitting there and trying to decide what her feeling about it was. And I and I and I realized uh, she thought it tasted good and she enjoyed the experience. And so I was a little bit aligned with the character at that point mm. because I in that moment I recognized I think thoroughly my weirdness. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it, this feels good to be in this place. This isn't an aberration. This isn't a problem that needs to be fixed, which was, I think, kind of what she was going through. This is where I belong. So it was a very powerful writing experience for me. And I've had those sometimes where, you know, the, the conclusion of the story is also, you know, a gift to me. Mm. And when I finished, I was, I thought this one, you know, this one, this is it. And then I sent it out and it kept getting rejected and it kept getting rejected. And somewhere in there, I went to my library and I found the um, anthologies, The Year's Best Fantasy and Horror, uh, which used to be edited by Ellen Datlow. 
and Terry Winling. And I started reading all these stories. And I was like, well, this is what I'm doing. So with that information, I finally sent my story to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Hmm. And when I did that, you know, so now this is after years of being rejected in poetry and many years of being rejected um, with short stories. The Girl Ate Butterflies was rejected. I, you know, I don't count these things because it's all so upsetting, but a lot of times. And so, so when I sent it to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, I thought, well, you know, if this isn't it, I think. I need to think of a different idea for my life. Um, But it did get accepted. And so um, after that, I was just quite happy to keep sending my short stories to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, where I had, um, you know, some a very nice experience of um, being accepted. And again, it was at a time where these these acceptances were coming in the mail. So that was always very fun. And Mm. um, you just go into my get the mail and have a letter saying they accepted a story. It was, it was wonderful. I, um, and I went on from there. Um, uh, I don't know which stories to highlight. Oh, that's, that's all right. I mean, we're, we're going to, as we go, you know, maybe toward the end of the episode, we're going to talk about the newest thing that you're putting out. But I, you know, I was just kind of curious about, uh, about what people can go check out. Um, is that uh, that story, The Girl Who Ate Butterflies, um, is that uh, published anywhere that people can actually go find it still? Hmm, I'm trying to remember. I don't... Hmm, I think it it might be in one of my collections. Oh, okay. So, uh, so go buy them all. Everybody go buy all the collections. Just buy the collection. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Well, let's let's get into uh, kind of talking about short stories as a concept. And the reason I am curious about this isn't because I've never read a short story, uh, but I think like a lot of our listeners, I, I'm probably in the same boat as a lot of them where um, you know, short fiction is great, but I'm used to, and I seek out longer fiction, you know, especially, Hey, you talk about epic fantasy readers and, you know, you're, you're giving them a doorstopper every few weeks and saying, mm-hmm. have fun, you know? Um, and so the, so the idea of a short story is while it's not foreign, it's definitely, um, a little different than your typical fantasy sci-fi readers experience. Um, if they, if they do line up with that kind of, uh, you know, historical reading of, of longer, longer things. Um, and so I, so I want to talk about, you know, how short stories works, work, their strengths and weaknesses and, and how we can think about them, what they're meant to accomplish or what they can be meant to accomplish perhaps. Um, so let me just start with kind of a definitional question. And that is what is a short story, especially if we line it up, the, the term short story, if we line that up next to a novella or a novelette or something, are there, in your mind, clear distinctions between these things? Or are the lines kind of fuzzy and it's just, hey, this is, it's just shorter fiction? You know, how does that work for you, definitionally? Well, well that's a very good question. I mean, yeah, there's, the, there's just the word count issue. But... Um, if, So I think, um, but beyond that, the opportunities within the space of that word count um, is is different. Mm. There is, um, I I feel that the short story is rather aligned with poetry in that it's Mm. often reflective of a moment um, or moments and arrives. well, it's just very hard to answer this question because <laughs> okay, everything I okay. said, I can think of, I'm like, no, that sure, you know, not that I can name them, but I'm like, uh, um, I would just say that when I think of it, I mostly think of a word count, but, you know, you can't just give me, you know, 7,000 words and it's a, it's a short story. So um, I think there does have to be a sense of 
this traveling from one place to another, but that, that place can be emotionally, physically, it can actually, I'm sure somebody could write a successful short story where the characters are in one place, but the, the reader arrives at a different right. place. Um, years and years, years ago, I read a short story where, uh, um, this disturbing behavior kept repeating itself. And it was, it was, I was like, this story, what is going, it was very consciously um, disturbing behavior. Next day, the same disturbing behavior. Next day, the same disturbing actions. Mm. It was almost exactly, and I was like, what am I doing? Why am I reading this story? What is going on? And all of a sudden I realized, oh, it was really making me aware. And it, it was very successful in that. And I, and I do believe that's what it was purposefully doing. Mm. So, um, so the, the experience of traveling from one place to another was really in me, the reader, and in me asking why am I opening this door every day? You know, instead of just asking why the characters are, why am I continuing to read? Mm. So, it, you know, it's actually a hard question for me to answer. But um, I, I do think that uh, for a short story, if it's going to carry a lot, if it, it, then I feel like the most successful structure is almost like a Nautilus. Uh, I think if a short story is trying to go you know, um, with a straight line of material and trying to carry as much as um, change or alteration as you know, bigger work, it, it it will it often seems like it collapses under that collapses yeah. under that weight. Mm. Yeah, no, I like a I like a lot of what you've said here. Um, it, for for my part, I don't know that it, there's a there's there's a functional or aesthetic difference maybe between some of these, but it, but it would be slight perhaps and with so many of these uh, distinctions you know we're not even talking about genre right now but we could bring in that concept of genre so many of these distinctions probably often come down to economics uh, you know so what is a novella well, it's something that could comfortably be published by itself between two covers and you know uh, and sold on its own mm -hmm. whereas a short story maybe being short enough that, uh, yeah, you're probably going to want to put a few of these together before it's time to bind them and, and sell them. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe there's just that simple economic explanation, but as an experiential question, um, it's, I, I just feel like it's, um, the shorter you get, the more specific your story and your purpose needs to be. How, how fair do you think that is? Um, you know, if I'm if I'm writing a yeah three hundred thousand word doorstopper, I can fit all sorts of concepts and characters and uh, events and and whatnot inside my story. But if I'm trying to do something in seven thousand words, five thousand words, ten thousand words, then I need to be more focused. I you know I'm I'm here with a clear purpose. I'm you know get in get out that sort of thing. How how does that sit with you? Well, you know, that does say, I've never written anything 300,000 words, so I can't, <laughs> I, I can't really um, describe that experience. You know, me neither. Me neither. <laughs> we share but that in I, common. I can say that when I work on a short story, one of the questions that when I'm starting to get, you know, draft, 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 and at a certain point, then I, and I'm like, this is what the story has come to say. Now everything has to say it. Every, everything. Hmm. You know, the. Even even where, obviously when it's not apparent because it's not supposed to be didactic, it's not supposed to be super obvious. But all the interactions, all the metaphors, everything should be feeding what this story has come to say. So um, in that way, I definitely agree with you. Yeah, and for my experience, sorry, go on. Well, I was going to say for my experience, and I think I enjoy that as a reader, but I don't really read you know, checking that off in my head either. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, it's a, well, obviously it's a very different experience as a reader, <laughs> Bring, you know, yeah. uh, absorbing the concepts rather than trying to come up with them. Um, yeah, it, I guess it would get very tedious to do what you're describing 
for a, a very long time, both as a reader and as a writer, you know, it, so if, if every, if the, <laughs> if you have one concept and you're hitting that concept over and over again, and you're doing that for a thousand pages, yeah, that's going to be, it's going to be tedious, but you can do that for you know 50 pages for 30 pages um, and you know, I, works out um, just fine. Offer for consider so I wrote a, sh a novel and it's a short novel, The Shipbuilder of Belfry, and I, I would have to say that I I I feel like I applied that technique to that novel too, but the specificity becomes becomes slight becomes broader. Hmm. Um, if that makes any sense, <laughs> like as the story yeah, you goes, know, it, you mean? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it 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 too. I felt like came um, to talk about um, this one thing, and that you know all the interactions and all the material and all the metaphors are speaking to that. I hope um, without it being tedious. But but that there's nothing. Uh, that what I try to do with anything I write is get it to a point where if I um, add anything else, it's or pull anything out, it sort of falls apart a little bit. Hmm. And when I, I read other work, that's that I enjoy that feeling in it. Yeah, yeah, well, that's good. Um, let me. Let me ask you this then. Um, we've talked a little bit about your history. Now we've got some definitions going and and how short fiction works. Um, is, is there one story that you love the very most? You know, outside of your own. Yeah. <laughs> is there any story that you recommend the most often to people who want to give short fiction a try? Um, I've got mine chambered and ready to go, ready to fire. Um, so I can give you mine if you'd like, but I am curious to hear about yours. Well, I am curious to hear, hear yours. I don't think I would have one that I would just, that I would broadly tell people. Mm. Uh, I, I, I usually like to get a little sense of, um, who they are, you know, what they're looking for, but I can, you know, I love, um, Joyce Carol Oates, where are you going? Where have you been? Mm. Uh, I love Stephen King's The Reach, which, oh, um, interesting. Is a, is a big favorite of mine. Mm -hmm. um, I love Brad, Ray Bradbury's. I think it might be called the Fourth of July. Not sure about that one. Um, I, I'm trying to think. Oh, another one, and I always forget which the author uh, name of this one, and I forget the title too. So this is going <laughs> to be super helpful. The but perfect it's recommendation. John, <laughs> it's either John Cheever or John. Oh God, what's his, what's his other other guy's name? But it's like one fine thing or something. It's yeah, John thing. Cheever. Yeah, sure. You know, okay, beautiful short story that I I hold quite close to my heart. Um. So yeah. and if, so, I don't I don't have one that I just recommend all the time. I usually I do like to help people find things that they love. But there's usually a little bit of a back and forth that goes on with that. What is yours? I'm well, so it, first of all, I think you're right. I, I, when it comes to recommendations, you, you've got a tailor. Um, but I guess it, maybe as a as a result of doing a podcast for a long time for a general audience, I have come up with uh, my favorite recommendations in in certain categories. You know, so uh, you never read a fantasy novel. Here's the one that yeah. I can kind of just say, uh, yeah, there's a good chance you'll like this one. Um, but when it comes to short stories, I remember actually I, I, I had forgotten about this until you started uh, bringing up a few of these authors. But I remember reading back in high school, um, Flannery O'Connor uh, and oh. a, a Good Man is Hard to Find, very popular oh, yeah. assignment for high school students. And it, there have been a few assignments that I can remember from my school days. Um, you, gosh, maybe maybe three or four assignments that I can remember that now I think back on and think that this is exactly what an English teacher is hoping that one student from the class will get when they assign this thing. And, you know, and, and so when somebody assigned a good man is hard to find it, it hit hard. I really enjoyed it. 
so that worked out really well. Um, but my all time favorite, and this is, this is a very personal thing. It's not the one that I necessarily recommend to everybody forever at all times, uh, is actually one of Tolkien's only short stories, uh, oh. which is Leaf by Niggle. Um, uh, he, he wrote a few pieces of shorter fiction. This is one of the very shortest. Um, and we did this. So if anybody, uh, is curious about this we covered this in episode 181 so you can go back and listen to that if you're curious about it um but it's uh it's for somebody who is famously um distrustful of allegory tolkien wrote an amazing allegory <laughs> <laughs> it is uh have you ever read it i haven't read it i'm oh. sorry I'm no sorry no no well here that's it's my recommendation for you now you should check it out um oh. yeah it's it's really quick you know it's 20 30 pages you're in and out of there um but it's this amazing meditation on what it means to live life now and what may happen after we die from a very you know tolkien catholic perspective and um it's yeah, what what uh, a short story it is delightful i will so. check it out of course now i'm thinking of all these other of course shirley jackson mm. and i like her like really um so, you know some of her wicked wicked short stories the most um uh what was her name shirley shirley, shirley jack jackson then... yeah right okay um well okay so this actually brings up um a, a question which is you know, we've talked about some of the uh so some practitioners of the short story arts from generations past, but is there anybody else writing today that you really appreciate that you might recommend to people uh, to, to check out some more contemporary authors? Yeah, I'm a, um, a big fan of David Surface. Uh, he had a, a collection come out last, I think last year. And, um, and he and his, uh, well, so he had a collection come out last year, the name of which I can't remember right now. But I love his short stories. And Christopher Barzak, who also won the Shirley Jackson Award for um, short story writing. Um, I really like Emma Jane Gibbons' um, short story collection that also came out um, a year or two ago. Uh, Sophia Samatar writes um, short stories and um, you know, novels. And I think she just had a memoir come out. She's quite um, wide in her approach. And she has, writes beautifully. Um, those are some names off the top of my head. Yeah, no, that's perfect. This, this is all I'm looking for is uh, for, well, I mean myself, because I'm, I'm very, very selfish, uh, but for our <laughs> listeners also to have a chance to just, you know, pick out a few names. And, and if people are curious about this, I did this with the um, romance episode as well, uh, where I drew out a few recommendations and then I, I put those on Twitter. Uh, so if anybody is wants to see the links to these, I'll find the links and I'll put them on Twitter um, but I am not going to crowd out the links to uh, Mary Rickert's work on in our show notes. So that one will stand alone. That will be in the show notes. <laughs> um, thank you. Well, I, you know, I love sharing the writing space with people. Well, it's, so, you know, it's one of those. Uh, isn't it funny how there are some professions? Well, and I, I should say some people who treat certain professions this way or that way. But I think some professions are more given to um, competition and ladder yeah. climbing. And, you know, once you get above somebody, you kick them until they fall down. Uh, whereas writing, it, it kind of has to be collaborative. It, it, you know, some people don't treat it that way, obviously, but, but it works so much better if, if it's a community and you're helping each other and, you know, working on raising the tide for all the boats, et cetera, et cetera. I think so. No, I agree entirely. I Years ago, this is going to seem sort of sideways, but when I was working on being a writer, I worked in a coffee shop. It was pretty popular. And it was, it was the only one. I'm also old enough that I remember when I used to live in Sequoia National Park just for two oh, years, wow. but it was like I was gone for, from the world. And when I came down the mountain, all of a sudden there was this thing called coffee shops. <laughs> and my friend, my friend's like, yeah, it's this place. And you just go and you sit there and you just drink coffee. And I was like, what? 
But eventually I ended up working at a coffee shop, you know, really early shifts so I could work on my writing. And um, and then another coffee shop was moving into town. And everybody was very worried about this and asked <laughs> the owner, you know, Dan, aren't you worried? And then the coffee shop's coming in. And I was always impressed, you know, that he said, no. He said, it's if, if they come to this town looking for coffee shops, that's good for both of us. You know, yeah. that'll be good for all of us. It was a very different way of looking at business. But I think it did, you know, infect my thinking about life in general. Yeah. If you're doing something good and people are coming around the neighborhood looking for it, you can all benefit from it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, that's generally how I think about, you know, us in the podcasting space. And with the exception of the Inking Out Loud mm -hmm. podcast, those guys are terrible. Nobody should ever listen to them. <laughs> Sorry, Drew. <laughs> that, oh, I, I mean, I'm laughing, but I don't really know what you're oh, talking no, about. Oh, no, I, I, yeah, no, sorry. Okay. <laughs> we love those guys. Um, okay, I was like, I better check this because I'm ho, ho, ho. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I walked you right into the trap and now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I want to go back before we leave short stories and, and talk, because I do want to talk a little bit about uh, Lucky Girl, the, the newest thing that you're putting out. Um, I do want to talk about something that you brought up at the beginning, which was that you started with poetry and that kind of uh, it it led you in a roundabout way, perhaps, or in an unexpected way, at least into short stories. But as you were talking about that, it, it struck me that there probably is a lot in common with the two styles um, there. <laughs> it's tricky, you know, when we talk about uh, about verse um, versus prose, uh, perhaps. Um, but in this case, maybe it's maybe it just has to do with the the focus of the intent uh, behind what you're doing. Uh, it, but I, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on this interplay between poetry and and short stories. Can you tell me a little bit about I do, that? I, I do. I actually um, there's a poetry book called Rhymes Reason. Mm -hmm. Rhymes Reason by John Hollander, and uh, it it is provides examples of all these different sort of structures of poetry, the villanelle, the da da, da. Mm. And as and he's describing these different um, sorts of poetry in the form he's describing. So if he's telling you what a villanelle is doing, he's writing that in a villanelle mm. form. So it's very, very impressive. And I always had this sort of idea, which I never did, but I always thought it would be really fun to go through Rhyme's Reason and then try to write um, short stories sort of inspired from these different poetic structures. But the one thing I, and it's fairly recently that I really fully realized that, um, in a, I was talking to somebody else and I was saying, well, the short stories I write, and, and it seems to be the short stories I enjoy a lot, do not seem to have a sense of like a direct line. Mm. They do seem to have more of a shape of the, that seashell shape, the Guggenheim shape, that Nautilus shape. Um, and when, when I get stuck, in writing, not stuck. When I get to a point in a short story where nobody's saying anything and nothing's happening and I'm not, I, I learned rather than looking into that vast emptiness to, to look back. And I think that is a, a, something that is prominent in a lot of poetry, this sort of repeating a phrase or tone or sound translated to short story. It might be a character that in the beginning I thought was minor and was going to be on and off the page and gone actually is going to appear again. Oh, this mm. person has something else to say or this inc this incident that seemed this occurrence that seemed incidental Actually, I'm going to pick that up again now here. Um, and I do see, I see a lot of poetry in that and applying that into short stories uh, so that when I arrive at the end of reading a short story or writing a short story, it feels... Um, you know, maybe almost like a, a you know, like a blossoming, uh, which is also closing. You know, there's that yeah. sense of opening and closing uh, rather than that walking a, a straight line 
you know, to the end. So I, I see a lot in that. And in the same way, I think the language is applied. And, and again, I'm not going to repeat exactly the same. Well, maybe a person would, and there would be benefit to that uh, for the same reason there is benefit to repeating language in poetry. But in the short story, I might look at something that's the metaphor over here and realize um, if I move it further along in the short story, now it's going to have a different sort of resonance. Mm. So there's a there's a building within the form, but the structure is is not stacking. It's more like I I, I this I keep saying. See, I'm even doing it the way I talk. I'm telling <laughs> my own Tom Holland moment. But it's that nautilus shape, so that um, you there's it builds on the sense of space, or like a tornado. You know that sense mm. of space of um, this holds all of that. This holds all of that. This holds all of this. From here, I can see all the way through to the center, yeah, and in oh, that man. center. That's that moment of like, oh, this works. Whether um, whether it can be easily identified or not, there's a sense of completion about it. Yeah. And I think that is true in poetry. This is so interesting. Um, I, I, Nat, you've, you've got my brain all turning, and I, and I don't have any definitive thoughts about this, but I now I'm wondering about short short fiction and poetry versus longer fiction where you know nobody is going to say that uh the structure uh, or you know the story type or story arc or story shape as you're putting it isn't important in longer fiction of course it is uh but you but with longer fiction i wonder if there's more of a tendency to because things develop more slowly you're just in the story and you're experiencing it as the character's experience where with shorter fiction and with poetry uh that structure comes to the fore perhaps more easily and plays a more prominent role in how the story is perceived um and so for somebody who really enjoys uh getting into um the the, the kind of technicalities the how how is how did this author achieve you know telling me the story this way um, maybe there's more to dig into with some the shorter fiction and the, the different shapes you're talking about, which I'm going to have to go research, you know, these this Nautilus shapes and the seashell shapes and the, all this and that <laughs> shape and all these. I'm going to have to learn more about it. But uh, yeah, do you, any thoughts from what I was saying? Yes, I think um, one of uh, years ago, I had a, I took a writing workshop from Douglas Glover who's, uh, he lives in the States, but I, I think he's still considered a Canadian author. And he um, taught a wonderful lesson that I did use. So we've, we've, we've talked about language, and then I've also talked about, you know, the metaphor and that sense of repeating. And, and he talked about time in short stories and you know he felt that a, a very successful short story is going to be similar to how um people talk where we talk about the future we we also reference the past and then there's a present time and you know his theory was that the more you can do that the more there's going to be a almost like musical resonance in the short story so how do you find out if that's occurring um, at the time, what, what I did, and I think this was um, what he said we should do, is I printed a short story. I remember it was The Pugilist at Rest. Um, and again, I can't remember the person, author's name, but it was very popular at the time. I liked it very much. And then I chose a different color marker, one for past, one for present time, one for future tense. Um, and then there, you know, and then even within that, there's these iterations. So, um, Every time something was referenced as past, that was one color. If it was a, a future tense, that was another color. If it was present, another color. Hmm. Um, and at the end, you know, so that was, and it was going on through the whole story. And then at the end where that was, there was that sense of like, oh my gosh, this short story is really working. This is coming together. All those colors were in there. Oh, it was, and it created, it's like it was a visual example of this almost you know song that um 
or these bells that are being rung in ways mm. that I didn't even wasn't consciously aware of. And I think I think you could apply that same technique to you know a lot. Uh, to, I'm trying to remember what you asked about initially with the short stories, but it was something like that that yeah. made me think. Oh, I bet you could do the magic marker thing on that aspect. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, long I long time think- long time listeners and viewers. Uh, can probably remember me showing on the YouTube channel my copy of the Lord of the Rings that I did something similar with. It's all color coded, oh. and oh, it was uh, doing that with four hundred thousand words is a different experience. <laughs> but you uh, did it with the whole thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, not not the same thing you described, but it's all color coded and helped me oh. see different things about Good how the story you. works. So Good for you. I think that is. I think that's so. I think it's. I think it's a really great gift to yourself as a reader, as a writer, and it's such an opportunity to really, um, I don't know how you can get closer to a writer than to do something like that. And um, it's a wonderful, I, when I, I, um, I did go to school for an MFA and one of the program things we did at the end is we had to write a, a paper, you know, a long paper, basically. Mm-hmm. And I wrote about Sophie's Choice by um, William Sterone, and I wrote about the gothic elements of Sophie's Choice. And there was, so I was, I, it was a work I had read many times, and I, but I had never really read Looking for the Gothic Elements before, but I was doing that. I was really crawling into it. It was a lot of, you know, that same mm-hmm. sort of stuff you were describing. Yeah. And there were, this is, but there was one night I woke up in the middle of the night and I walked over to my desk and I was looking out the window and it was snowing and I was thinking about, you know, my work. And, but the thing was, is it wasn't my work for just this moment I was William Sterone working on Sophie's choice. <laughs> it was just this moment. And honestly, it was one of the most beautiful experiences and also so heartbreaking because I'll never write like that. But it was, it was this wonderful moment and connection and opportunity, you know, to remember in the end who I am and what I can do and what I aspire to and what's been done. And, um, and the real gift of a fiction that's out there for all of us. I think it's wonderful that you did that. Well, it's, um, we did an episode or I think it was one of my solo ruminations episodes <laughs> a couple of years ago where I was asking the question, is it better to be read uh, or, or to read widely or deeply? Um, and the, the conclusion I came to was that, hey, everybody has their own styles and some people prefer to just take in as much as they can and other others prefer to kind of dive deeply into a fewer number of things. Um, but as you're saying that, I, you know, I wonder if I'm shifting a little more toward, you know, reading widely is good, but give yourself the gift of going deep on something. Um, it, it re- it's, it's a remarkable experience um, when you, when you really dig into a work and short fiction, if we bring it back to our subject for today, short fiction obviously makes it, it, by its very nature, a little easier to do that. You don't have to devote your entire mm-hmm. life <laughs> to right. to something <laughs> where you you can you can kind of uh, grok something maybe a little not more easily but more quickly. Um, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah, there, there's something there. Anyway, all That's right. So, so Mary Rickard, you are uh, you're the author of many things but most recently you're the author of something with one of my favorite uh, subtitles now it's called <laughs> lucky girl lucky girl how i became a horror writer a krampus story yeah. <laughs> so i i have to ask you about this uh, we'll we'll leave the um the discussion behind for now uh, and I wanted to ask you about this book. Give us kind of the elevator pitch. What is this and uh, why does it have such a fantastic title? Oh, thank you. Well, this is the story of 
row. You Okay, now you're going to find out I'm really bad at elevator pitches. It's really good that I don't <laughs> ever really have to do them. But this is a story of Ro who finds herself facing uh, Christmas alone and invites um, three ver- three people she's only recently met to her house for Christmas. Uh, and they begin, they tell stories to each other, which she invites them to do as a way just to, to keep them around. And the story, um, the story seemed to unleash um, a certain, um, I'm so bad at this. So then there's these kind of like horror stories and, um, and Ro has had a, a, a very traumatic past then the story continues uh, with them meeting again the next year and then many, many, many years later. Mm. And um, oh, it sounds, sounds very better. Stephen Kingy <laughs> that way, right? <laughs> I think I, I don't know if it's, um, I don't know. Do you think it's Stephen Kingy? Well, I mean, the, the group of friends who, you know, they, over yeah. the years and there's the flashbacks and the, the yeah. I love that thing in stories. I love that with, yeah. when Stephen King does that. I, I do enjoy that. And, and this- OK, so I hope it's better than I just made it sound. Though. <laughs> but the, the, um, the title, I, you know, I knew I wanted it. I knew pretty soon it was going to be Lucky Girl, how I became a horror writer. And I. I I knew I was a little bit speaking to, you know, some of the horror tropes and there's a little bit in there about writing at a certain point. I was really tempted to, you know, lean on that a lot more, but I was afraid I was going to pull away from the story itself too much. And I, I really liked what was happening with the characters. So then I knew, uh, if I just said lucky girl, how I became a horror writer, people would think it was a book about, uh, you know, a nonfiction book about right. writing. So then I was like, okay, it's either got to be a Christmas story or a Krampus story. And I kept going back and forth because um, I will say that the element of Krampus is there, but may, you know, maybe not as uh, fully embodied in the story as some people wish, you know, and I've been thinking about that since I realized that was some of the feedback. And I was like, I think what I why I decided to land on a Krampus story rather than a Christmas story is because it's the story itself and the things that happen are really sort of like the spirit of Krampus mm. more than the spirit of Christmas. And, you know, maybe I should have put that in some place, you know, <laughs> as, as a guide for, for people's expectations. Um, but that's basically how the, t- the title came about. And I thought when I sent it out uh, that I, am, I thought it would just be something that would, if it got accepted, it would be published online. And then when um, the, I got the offer from Tor, you know, to print it, that was exciting. And I expected somebody to say, well, you know, but we can't do that long title. <laughs> um, but they, you know, they, they supported it and Good. printed it with that. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it helps that I think Krampus is really having a moment in the last five years or so. It's uh, becoming a little more prominent culturally. So anyway, yeah. but uh, but people should go check it out. I, I hope they do. I will include a link to Lucky Girl in the uh, show notes. Uh, so whether you're Thanks. watching on YouTube or you're listening on the podcast, go check out the link to that. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, true to form, Mary, it's not the longest book, you know, so people can read it in a sitting and enjoy it. And, yeah. uh, yeah. so it's what, about 110, 115 pages or something like that. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a novella. It can yeah. be read in a one cold night. There you go. <laughs> Well, Mary Rickett, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate uh, your time um, and uh, hope hope that you had a good time on the show as well. 
I, you know, I did have a good time. I get very nervous before these things, but you made me very comfortable and I appreciate your thoughtful <laughs> questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Um, and for everybody else uh, who has, if, if you have kind words, you should go leave a review on the podcast. <laughs> if you don't, then you know, don't bother, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but Otherwise, please go to thelegendarium.com uh, to go check out past episodes sorted by author, by subject. Um, and also you'll find links there to our discord server, the friendliest place on the internet. I promise it's awesome. Um, and, uh, also our link to the Patreon page. So if you enjoy what we do and want to put a dollar in the tip jar for, uh, every episode that we do, it's much appreciated. Please go check out the Patreon page. Otherwise, uh, once again, Mary, thank you for coming and for everybody else. Thank you for listening and I will see you next time. <laughs>